let's go. Okay, let's do this. Um, well, first of all, congratulations on your appointment as Vermont's fourth cartoonist laureate. That's awesome. I saw the ceremony online. <laughs> well deserved, sir. Yeah, we were supposed to meet with the governor, but because of the COVID, I wasn't able to do that. Well, that's, I think that's amazing. Um, well, let's, let's dive into dream work um, from the very beginning. Um, the beginning of this article, I'm of course going to give a little bit of context as to who you are and whatnot for those that don't know you but i want to jump right into dream work which is really interesting to me um you call in one of your latest issues you call dream work a deeply intuitive practice of mining the unconscious psyche that's your definition of it which i love and you started dream work in your 20s early 20s um based upon really powerful dreams or you had an introduction to young at that time which came first and if you want to kind of go into that a little bit first it was uh, the dreams i was in my early 20s and uh, you know i just kind of crashed my life <laughs> and i was in a deep depression i could hardly get out of bed and uh, i just started to have these series of really powerful dreams kind of nightmare like but also beautiful and uh, somehow interesting to me and so I started writing and drawing them down um, I actually have the one of the books here this would be in 1974 and I just started you know writing and drawing I don't know if you can see these yeah oh wow <laughs> um, and right at that uh, time as I started to get into it thankfully somebody gave me a, a big fat book of you know various writings by Jung and I didn't quite understand it but man it was just uh, you know it was exactly what I needed to read it started to give me the tools I need needed to understand what the dreams were trying to tell me and I quickly figured out that they were trying to set me right trying to make me whole again um, and uh, uh, that was the beginning of my serious dream work. Ever since then, I've been writing down and drawing my dreams. That's, uh, that, uh, that began in 1974. Um, well, so it was quite some time until you, uh, I mean, you had a very awesome career um, throughout that time period. And then you came up with the idea um, to do Rare Bit Fiends, which came out in 1994 and so it looked like that the impetus of that because you had been kind of recording your dreams and stuff obviously that whole time but the impetus of that was Scott McCloud's 24-hour comic challenge it got it going but I've been thinking for a long time that I wanted to do some sort of dream comic I just didn't know what or how and I was sort of gripping it too hard you know I was thinking well I'm, I can't do this until I can draw as good as Moebius or as good as Hal Foster or something. But the truth is, I'll never be that good of an artist. Um, but what Scott's challenge did for me was it loosened me up and it allowed me to um, draw my dreams really quickly in sketchbook form, which I also brought here. Oh, that's amazing. So that this is what you had in the most recent issue of Rabbit Fiends, did? Yeah. Ultimately, I'll, 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 I will be, um, you know, reprinting all of them. I love it. I probably did it for like four or five months. You know, every day I would try to mm. um, draw one dream or, or a bunch of dreams that I remembered um, really quickly, maybe spend, you know, 15 minutes at it. So it didn't fit in with Scott's challenge of a 24-hour comic because he had certain rules. But it, uh, in my own life, it really, uh, I could begin to see the patterns that I hadn't seen, even though I was writing my dreams you know, for 20 years, up to a, the aspect of drawing them uh, showed how patterns develop through dreaming over time. And I, um, that got me really excited and so, as soon as I could afford it, because it takes money to launch a comic, as you probably know, um, I, I, I you know, really bit into it and, and started Rarebit Fiends as a monthly comic, uh, drawing it as good as I could rather than sketching it. Um, and uh, the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> 
So other than Windsor McKay's um, Dreams of the Rare Bit Fiends, did you have any other major influences um, at that well, time? Well, Jack Kirby did a, a great dream comic. Uh, it turned out that uh, even though I wasn't aware of it, there were a lot of uh, early dream comics around the time of what McKay was doing. Um, we did an art show in uh, Amadora, Portugal, and they did a history of it. And they, they found like 10 or 15 uh, daily and Sunday comic strips from early in the 20th century that were people sort of like working off of what uh, McKay was doing and doing their own like dream comics and stuff. So I think dream comics are an authentic genre of comic, of the comic art form. You know, they're never going to make anybody any money because it's so esoteric and metaphysical, but it, it, it they, they fit into comics in this really profound way. Um, uh, and I guess as a person who does it, it I, I find it really nourishing to work with my dreams that way and to produce a, a finished product that allows other people to get inside my unconscious and experience it. Speaking of your unconscious, you um, mentioned various patterns that you were starting to see um, in those dreams and what you know, I see a lot of patterns in you know your early rare bit themes work which of course you reflect later on what were some of those patterns and what did they mean to you the biggest one was landscape um, <clears throat> right from the beginning I was drawing maps of the landscape that a, a powerful dream would be uh, played out on and um, I began to see certain things like the river the mountain and ultimately, um, in my later work with the Mercurius stuff, um, <clears throat> there's the idea of Jacob's Ladder, which you're probably familiar with in a mythological and religious sense. But essentially, it's just when you're having a dream, you, you'll see that, you know, there are lower areas in the dream and there are higher areas on the land itself. And this will give you an indication of what part of the psyche the dream is exploring in. So that was like the biggest one right there. That's awesome. Um, so uh, your first iteration of Rarebit Fiends ended in with number 21. Was that in 96? Yeah, something like that. 96? Yeah, and it, so... It was kind what, of collapsing. So <laughs> do what? The, the comics industry was kind of collapsing, so I just couldn't continue it financially. That it was the comics implosion then that caused, that's all I was going to ask is what caused you to stop creating it? They, they sort of, uh, all the distributors went out of business and it ended up just being one distributor and they kind of cut out all the uh, underground and independent stuff, made it really more, much more difficult to put out a comic than it was, you know, 10 years prior to that. Um, so you talked about in one of your early or your latest issues, Dr. Jerry, Jeremy Taylor. Um, and uh, the, I, I think he was part of the International Association for the Study of Dreams, which declared Rare Bit Fiends to be like, um, what did he say? That first egalitarian dream art journal, which is amazing. But you, you mentioned in Little Omens um, that he made a correlation between comics and dream work um, and that this was kind of your impetus for your latest iteration of Rare Bit Fiends, which is the Art of Mercurius. Can you go into that a little bit about what it was about Jeremy Taylor's correlations and how Mercurius kind of came to be? Well, Jeremy was a, <clears throat> one of the founders of the Association for the Study of Dreams. Um, and he's written, he had written four or five really excellent books on dream work. And he worked with thousands of people, you know, you go into prisons and work with prisoners and stuff, um, had its terrific understanding of what dreams were. And uh, he kind of sought me out. He found Rarebit Fiends in uh, a comic book store and sought me out early on with probably fifth or sixth issue of the original, you know, Rarebit Fiends. And we started a personal dialogue back and forth and I began to even though I wasn't uh, a client or anything, I began to, you know, call him up and talk to him about my dreams and he would counsel me on those. 
and uh, very, you know, had a lot of wisdom there. Just a really, really smart, smart guy. Um, he also has put out a series of comic books that um, I'm not sure how to get them, but they're about dream work. Um, you know, his art style is kind of crude. He's not professional, but man, he's got heart to it and this incredible knowledge. Um, it'd be worth looking up on Google, see if you can find those. They were done on a, as a print on demand through one of those, uh, you know, various schemes that they had going. Jeremy passed away a couple of years ago, as you might know. Mm -hmm. um, but the very, you know the very, name? excuse me? Do you know what the name of those comics were? Uh, so could, one was about projection. You know, they're all about mythology and, and basic stuff. Um, I'll, I'll do a search and see if I can find them and, and email you that. Yeah, that that would be amazing. I'll do a search myself. And so when I um, had to cancel publication of Rare Beans, he was like a cheerleader off to the side going, come on, Rick, you got to get back and do this because this is really important. He's, he really got it, like why comics and dreams worked. And he was, um, that, that was his quote, you know, saying it was the first egalitarian world dream journal. And it was something he and other people in the Association of Study of Dreams had been looking for. Because up to then, uh, the study of dreams was really academic. Yeah. So a lot of papers being done, but they're by these guys who were, you know, uh, professors and stuff, not, you know, blue collar folks like myself who were out there like living it and doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, saw a great value in that. I like that aspect to it. The blue collar, blue collar aspect to dream work. Mm -hmm. Um, that just might be a title of the article, Blue Collar Dreamer. Um, so what, uh, other than that, what inspired you to relaunch Rarebit Themes? Why now, why, you know, why this latest iteration? Well, the big thing was the kind of visionary experience that uh, came on me that resulted in um, the art of Mercurius. And what I learned when I went back and studied, restudied Jung again, to see what he was talking about. And I knew I had to, I really wanted to get it out, to let other people know about, but also to help me uh, digest it. Because it's you know, a difficult thing to grasp, um, but it's, I think it's uniquely important to each of us to um, try to get in touch with this thing. That's, that's what the, it's all about. Jung calls it, you know, the self. You know, other people call it God. Um, but there is a central unifying spirit that's living us. And what Jung calls when the self, uh, the self moves upon the dreamer, um, essentially that's getting in touch with this central unifying spirit, this essence of life. I think Jack Kirby probably hit it on the head by calling it the source and how he described it as a thing that we can all touch into. And it's actually like living us, you know, we're living it. Um, very hard to describe, very shape-shifting, but um, life-changing at the same time. And so uh, that was one of the reasons to get River Fiends going. The other was that um, I figured out how to use Amazon.com's uh, print-on-demand system, which made it really easy, comparatively, for someone like me to put out a comic and get it distributed. I didn't have to go through Diamond. Um, I just had to do the comic and get it up on the site and I'm in business, you know, yeah. free of all those crazy comic book business stuff. So that, that was definitely one of the emphasis right there. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I might've mentioned to you earlier, I, my wife and I do have done a lot of shamanic work um in the past dream work and stuff like that and one of our teachers calls that source the great originating mystery um yeah. because you just can't you can't tangible anytime you try to tan tangibly define it you it it loses its magic right yeah. it, it's got to remain a mystery of some sort so yeah it's like <clears throat> when it's given to you as an idea it's just more meaningless new age psycho babble. But when you live it, <laughs> when it descends on you and, you and you have a visionary experience and all of it changes your life and you begin this, it puts all the religion and myth and all of that stuff into a context that all of a sudden makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So kind of what you're really talking about is that this 
whole process of bringing rare bit fiends back was kind of what Jung calls individuation, which is the process where the self becomes whole and it's like the dissolution of the ego. So do you really, do you see this as an individuation process for you? It is individuation, exactly as he described it. I was misunderstanding leading up to it. <clears throat> I thought individuation was just sort of getting your shit together and not being neurotic. But there's a deeper level to it where you kind of work through all the shadow stuff and all the neurosis and stuff. And the deeper self makes itself aware to you. Um, and you know, that that is individuation. You're just, you're so right up my alley. I, before I continue, I just, I've always known of you, obviously, and you've always been a legend to me, but I didn't really actually, I wasn't really tapped into Rare Bit Fiends. I didn't really, for some reason, it wasn't on my radar. And so when you mentioned you wanted to do that, I was like, okay, cool, whatever he wants to do. And I bought everything I could buy. And I was, was reading it during this time. And I was just telling my wife, like, where has this been my whole life? Like this everything that you are tackling in this book is everything that i've always wanted to kind of see in comics and and it's just it's all so ingrained in my own experiences so i, I can't give you enough thumbs up <laughs> it's an amazing work thank you um okay so let's dive into artem and curious a little bit so subtle man used to be sort of kind of like your main imaginal figure rare bit fiends or showed up a lot um but with your return to mercurius um um th that's becoming more the main figure you referred to subtle man as more of being what you call like shamanic dreams and now mercurius is more alchemical i guess you could say so can you kind of go into like what you what you mean by that um for readers that may not understand um the differences between the two and kind of where you think who is Macarius to you and where is that leading you? It's a lot of questions. Probably you should start with subtle man and the idea of doing shamanic dreams. You know, like everybody else, some of my dreams are just normal everyday stuff, you know, dealing with my life and and things like that. You know, dream work acts like a keel in in the ocean of the unconscious that keeps me upright and helps me understand and, and keep my little boat going in the right direction and that's great but certain dreams that i call shamanic dreams seem to be trying to describe deeper levels of reality to me and i think to all of us and so um that subtle man subtle man was that experiment was to see if i could just pull those dreams out and do a bunch of comics about dreams that just had this you know weird otherworldly quantum dimension shamanic level that, that would be a great experiment um and so i was just about closing that one up when i had my first visionary experience um with the candle which launched the art of mercurius and it was uh, essentially just using a candle as a meditative thing just watching the flame bouncing and sort of like you know relaxing the ego and just allowing the unconscious to come up when the thing moved on me and it became like a real uh, full-on vision complete vision of, of reality that was like on this much deeper scale where um, the little hot coal that I was looking at on the wick became like this planet planet sized thing that you know and it was alive and looking back at me and it was just so clear and there was this incredible um feeling of distance it was as if there was like a hundred million miles between me and this thing and i could feel every inch of it so it was like this it was a visionary experience that completely took over my consciousness at that point and i got about four or five minutes of just being in touch with this you know sun-like <laughs> metaphysical blob that was alive and looking back and not only that but it's like the fact that you connect with it, it it's so delighted that you see it that's the thing it's like it's not only out there and and not only part of us but it wants to connect with us 
and when they talk about dissolution of the ego, they don't mean getting rid of your ego so that you can't operate in the world. It just means learning how to hypnotize your ego to allow this kind of experience to happen. If that makes sense. Yeah. To get the ideas of fear and desire and power out of your mind. And the ego is still there, it's observing, but the experience is happening, it's coming right out of the depths of the unconscious. And it's the reality of it is just unshakable. So this kind of changed my life, just having this one uh, incident. But uh, of course, you know, having been reading Jung for years, I was like, man, is this in there? I gotta go back and look. And sure enough, you go back and you reread Psychology and Alchemy, and uh, this kind of experience is exactly what um, the alchemists were talking about when they describe Mercurius as a person and this thing called the prime material. I don't know how familiar you are with alchemy. Yep. But prime material or prima materia or whatever it's called. Um, you know, it's like this sort of secret thing of what alchemy means. And, you know, it never made sense to me. But now it does. It's the prime material is this kind of experience and it changes your life so that everywhere you go, this is with you now, all of a sudden. Um, the other aspect of this experience was that it created a thought, a memory in my mind that was different than any other thought I'd ever had in my life. It had a tangibility to it. When I would call it up, it wasn't like a, a memory on a flat screen, like most of my memories. It was like a, a three-dimensional object in my mind. It's hard to explain unless you, you've had the experience. Um, and I think this is what they mean by the philosopher's stone. <laughs> that it, it, it's like this uh, new type of thought that once it's with you, you are connected to the spirit on this deeper level like all the time. It, this is this what's also I'm familiar with the philosopher's stone. Is this what's also referred to as um, a psychoid form, a psychoid thought form? Psychoidal thought. Form. That's how Jung described it. A psychoidal thought form. Um, and of course, he directs you back to the Gnostics, yep. who who were like early Christian variant. And that's how, what those guys were all about, was yes. like really having the experience of the divine, not sitting in church and ratcheting up prayers, but to really experience it. And I think, I think that's what happened to me. That's what I've always appreciated about um, Gnosticism and the shamanic worldview, because it just, it puts it all completely in your hands. There's no priests or pews or anything in between you and that source, like you're it. Yeah. And that experience sounds amazing. Like the the amount of detail, and you do, you do a really great representation of it in in rare bit beans of how it becomes this like three dimensional tangible form that then just starts spilling out into the rest of your life. Just sounds incredible. Which all kind of happened through um, in the form of uh, synchronicities. Can you go into that a little bit for those that may not know and how that how important that was to you yeah well synchronicities are kind of like signposts that let you know that you're on to the right thing and it's this point where the unconscious and the conscious uh, coexist in an event in time and space um, something that you're struggling with philosophically will uh, manifest itself symbolically in, in everyday life and you know of course you think about such things scientifically and it doesn't make any sense it sounds like madness but what happens to you it's like a, a vindication that uh, of whatever it is you're trying to piece together uh, like what is this uh, source what is it trying to tell me and bit by bit you'll get it and as you get it it will uh, ratify itself with with some odd dream or uh, some odd synchronistic event a lot of it sounds like madness to people who've never done it but if you're in the middle of it it's like yeah that's it that's the thing i want right <laughs> it's like you're having this one-on-one -on -one communication with the whole universe itself it's it's amazing well it kind of you know begs the question like what the hell's really going on that something like that can happen what is reality right 
Um, okay, so I want to I, I want to dive into um, well, let's just keep going. So Young also talked about because um, uh, I was listening to some work by no uh, man you're familiar with Jeffrey Raff who wrote a really cool book on Young and I was listening to a talk of his the other day and he was talking about um, amplification which is very much your book right so the process of ampli amplification according to Young is taking the same image and like studying it through many traditions and seeing that image everywhere and um, so of course with the image that you saw of the candle wick and how it turned into this cycloidal, you know, kind of spherical planetar planetoid form for you and kind of seeing how it interplayed through all of those synchronicities in your life. Um, there was at one point in, uh, I can't remember if it was in issue 22 or 23, you came upon a mesh of slush with black spots on it. And when you touch those black spots, they became fractals on your fingers. I love this comic so much. Um, but what I wanted to ask is that that image of like this form with these black spots and black like stripes and stuff is in your work a lot, even all the way back to the cat and rare bit themes of just like the black stripes and whatnot. But even so that that mesh and the form with the black spots was that the impetus for your panel vision book spotted stone which is a uh, great work by the way um well no it was tied up a little bit but it wasn't really the interesting thing about the fractals is that that was the beginning of dreaming telling me what to do next and this is this is why it's really cool you know you have the visionary experience and you follow it through and dreaming becomes much more clearer um, it's not just about uh, mythology and symbolism it's like there's like clear stuff that comes through and what came through was that I needed to pay attention to the animated fractals of nature I had like a couple of weeks where it was just like every night I would dream of like the grass swaying in the wind or the leaves trembling or the water all these natural patterns and uh, which ended with a, a dream of this alchemical lion and I, I like zoom in on the hair on its ass and the hair on its ass is like moving in this fractal thing so I started looking at that more closely in my life you know fortunately I live you know in Vermont so there's a lot of nature around me and I found that just by observing the animated fractals of nature my ego it was like a hypnotic effect on the ego and it allowed the door behind the mind to open up much more easily so like just sitting on my deck or sitting in front of my pond became a meditative experience of just fantastic and, and so much of it is just shutting up the voice in the head so it's not asking for things it's not worried about things it's not demanding it's just witnessing what's coming out of the unconscious if it comes out of the unconscious sometimes it's mythological sometimes it's just animated stuff but every once in a while it's the real thing that real juice um, that is the source and you know that's the coin of the realm as far as i'm concerned that's what i want out of life more than anything is to have that experience with clarity that's amazing I thought I, I, it just it felt like to me that the um, spotted stone was like a psychoidal form made manifest itself that you could just throw at somebody's head and then knock them into that space that you're talking about <laughs> like a magic pill almost. If That's only. the cool, cool thing about art is like everybody comes at it from a different direction and so see they see different things in it. So yeah, totally. <laughs> it, uh, another great book. Um. So um, I don't know how many uh, more issues that you think that you have planned. I know at one point I'd read, um, I think it was an interview in the comics journal. I can't remember where you said that you felt like you could be doing rabbit themes forever till, you know, till the end of your days. Um, do you have the art of Mercurius like all mapped out? Do you know that it's 
going to be, you know, so many issues long, or are you just on this journey and you're just following Mercurius wherever he takes you? Yeah, it's a living document. Um, it, you know, I, I'm hoping to end uh, Art of Mercurius as a book with the next chapter, but that's it's still I'm struggling with how to get it down because I'm living it at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, the important thing is Mercurius himself as a figure, I think. And that's probably something that we should discuss. Because the idea that the figure shows up in my dreams that's autonomous and calls me by name and talks to me and, and uses his, showing me his art, which all seems to be a way of describing deeper levels of reality. Like you look at the one where we're all sitting at the table and then there's this giant wave, sculptural wave that he's created. And as it comes down, it passes through dimension and subatomic particles fall out. I mean, that's like a picture of quantum mechanics. Um, and this is given to me by an autonomous dream figure who kind of always looks similar and it's always clearly him. And this has got me thinking that this isn't just me. This is like something all of us have in us as a potential. And that they're just like they're, we have an ego, which is an amazing psychological construction. We have a dreaming ego, which is different that dreams. Well, Mercurius is like the middleman. He's apart from the dreaming ego, but he's connected to the source. So he's like a messenger from the source. And that if you pay attention to what he's talking about and meditate on him, uh, you've got a much better chance of getting real information about whatever this thing is. I think, uh, you know, Jung has had this angel that he would imagine. And I, that's exactly it, I'm curious. I think the whole idea of angels, that's really is what it was all about. And probably in earlier times, people understood this better, that this, this messenger, to the gods or to God was in us. But our 20th century industrialized world has just sort of flattened all this stuff out of us. So um, it's probably important, I think, that these ideas get back out again because um, it's it, it's really where we're going as people. So like what, where we need to go is to get in touch with this thing. And in fact, I think kind of like why we were created is that's our job <laughs> is to like uh, go out and experience this, you know, 3D world that we're in, but also to experience the source of it so that the source of it can experience it, if that makes sense. So there's, um, have you ever heard of Patrick Harper? Mm -mm. So um, he's from England and uh, I can't remember what exactly he's a professor of, but he's got a, uh, series of excellent books um he's very well versed in Jungian psychology he gets into anthropology and um his first book is daimonic reality i actually have an extra copy so if you want i can send it to you i would love but, to read it oh yeah it's so it, it just it talks all about that like the daimonic realm um is that medium place between the self and soul and soul being that source soul is just you know that essence of that creative essence of the universe and um talks about how like plato um or socrates i'm sorry has had like a daimonic ally um like this invisible entity that kind of fed the wisdom to him and the exactly what you're saying that this is like we all have this like potential of like that medium that mediary between the daimonic soul realm or you know dream realm which i kind of see it as all as sort of the same um there's just different avenues of tapping into it and then you it's up to you to tap into that imaginal figure which all is like mercurius is like probably to clarify for readers mercurius is a symbol right i mean it's a it it it, it would express different to you than it would to me and so forth it would appear so yeah because whatever stance the ego comes from is going to define what these how these energies look when they enter consciousness. And for you, it's Benedict Cumberbatch. 
<laughs> well, it's well. The fact is, also, he's an alchemist. He's so clearly an alchemist. He's from 17th century. He's got the uh, male-female kind of thing, where he look, kind of looks like a girl sometimes, sometimes like a man. Yep. All the aspects of it, but the most striking one is that he appears to be wanting to teach me what different levels of reality are. That's kind of like extraordinary. That makes life worth living, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is extraordinary. That's amazing. So you're still working on issue uh, 25 then, I take it? I haven't started it yet. I've got these other projects ahead of it, but probably toward the end of the year, I'll be starting it. But I'm still struggling with how to, uh, you know, shape it all. And I'm still living it as well. You're going to have everybody, uh, me, most especially, chomping at the bit. Wow. <laughs> well, you should send in that two-page comic and I'll print it in the letters page. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. I there certainly will. I wondered if you'd saw that. That was kind of a fun thing that happened the last, not last night, but the night before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I would love to. That would be great. Thank you. And, and um, probably, the, the other thing I'd, I'd probably like to talk about please. is um, the vision, you know, the solar vision that, that was so strong and so powerful uh, evolved into, there's two of them which like goes against everything, you know, that you, you always think of a singular self and, right. you know, having two things like that, it's gotta be wrong, it's gotta be wrong, but no, it's right. One of them grows out of the other. And I think one is the soul and the other is God, although both those words have been trampled into the ground by idiots. Um, yeah. But whatever those entities are, are very real. And um, Mercurius will pass you through the soul to the divine if you allow them to. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it would only really make sense too because we live in this dualistic universe and like all my studies of alchemy and Kabbalah and stuff, there's everything always gets expressed in this like participation and interaction between two, like a battery or, you know, electronics. I mean, it just, it's, it's always very interesting to me. Do you see? Do you see it more like that, or do you see it more as? Um, or I mean, you you go ahead. Well, I think one of the problems is that it, it's described to us in the beginning when we don't understand it as this world of ideas and concepts, and you're trying to put it together. I mean, just using the word demonic, that's going to trigger so many people <laughs> in a in a negative way. Yeah. You know, because it's like demons all of a sudden. Yeah. I, you and I understand it, but someone who's like deeply Christian is going to see that as like, oh, devil worship or something. Right. Um, but um, I'm sorry, I lost my way. Where, where, where was I? <laughs> um, <laughs> the usage of language and how we term it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like it, it comes to us in, is, as ideas, which we try to figure out, but it, it's it, none of them mean anything once you have the experience and that's what makes alchemy so frustrating to so many people is like every, every alchemist has got his own terminology and his own figures and that's that's the key to it each of us is like a sacrament you know we each of us does this and it's going to look different to all of us the the central point of the source and the soul that's that's the same but we're all going to see it differently um, you know, I don't want to insult people who are religious and stuff, but I think all the religions are just, um, you know, old stale versions of, of stuff that happened to people, you know, centuries and centuries ago. But it's got to happen to the, the individual themselves. You can't just go to church and sit there and say prayers. That's not going to do it. It's just deeper communication with the self. And the Mercurius is the intermediary. He's Mr. In Between. And uh, to everybody, he's different. That's awesome. I Well, it seems like that, obviously, because of the way we're even talking about the struggle of putting these ideas into language and how it how it starts hindering the idea itself or the, the concepts that we're trying. Like, comics are the perfect medium for this because you have narrative, but like the narrative isn't really going to do much without, I mean, your narrative is great, but if we didn't have the images that come with comics and the way that they sequentially deliver 
this information, I I wouldn't have it felt here <laughs> as yeah. much as um, you know, just understanding something academically or whatever. And there's like a synergy between the words and the pictures too. There's like a magic in between that I'm always shooting for when I'm making my comics is so that someone reading it can kind of fill in a little bit of a blank here or a little bit of a blank there, a little bit of themselves to make it their own. It seems like they're the perfect expression for you to do what you want to do. I, it was, it's been perfect for me as, as I finally got into comics um, and just in the past few years from always wanting to do it my whole life, but um, you know, getting into it myself and expressing my own experiences kind of like in the way that you do, it's, I get it. You can talk about and express things that regular language just doesn't do justice. But, you know, you just held up the cover to Rare Fiends with the burning bush. Mm -hmm. right. Now, what is the burning bush? It's exactly right. what it's the fractals of nature, seeing the life in nature, looking back at you. And so was this the beginning of Judaism when Moses went on the mountain and was just like spacing out on, on the leaves trembling on a bush and saw the source? Is that where it all came from? Right. <laughs> or before or, yeah. or yeah. <laughs> I mean absolutely it's like all these um, yeah, concepts that are right there in all the religious texts it's like what was really happening here you know Ezekiel's vision and I mean there, there was there was some other kind of thing and that's like what's weird is we separate prophets and prophecy from the rest of us too as if that stuff doesn't happen anymore and yeah. it, but it does it happens all the time and it can happen in your life like at any moment of the day if you just open yourself it, it doesn't happen enough and i think part of it is we're in our world we're cut off from nature and, and nature is it. it it it's like the living expression of it and we create these artificial structures and, and places and roads and stuff and so we're always cut off from it and, and now with the screens it's like how many hours a day do we spend looking at screens? We're never going to find it there. Never. What? So what do you think? I mean, you've already said numerous things that I feel like are just the motto of this entire interview. Like what, what would be if you had like a final word, what would it be in terms of what your, what rare bit themes means to you and how, what do you want it to represent in the world? Boy, well, I don't know if I can clarify it in a sentence or two. It's too complex. I mean, it's my art, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to think that uh, you know I've done so much of it. That you know I've been commi so committed to it. Um, I understand it's difficult for some people to assimilate, um, but it, it's allowed me um, a journey of personal growth that is just one of the reasons I'm here on this earth, I think, is to do this and to, to get a better study of it. I wish I could explain it better. That's beautiful. That that kind of purpose is felt in the book, let me tell you, it absolutely is. Um, well, if you don't mind, I, I might just ask a few, a couple of other questions I to just maybe get into process a little bit. Um, sure. before wrapping up with you um, ask a little bit about what what's a typical day of making comics for Rick Beach look like well I'm set up really well I mean we live on a mountaintop in Vermont so even now with the COVID you know we're we're kind of insulated but that's why we've always lived up here um, I've got my studio across the street and uh, you know I get up in the morning I usually uh, go to the store pick up the newspaper uh, come back, you know, kind of look at it, have a cup of tea or something, and then I'll go over to the studio. And my first thing I do is I light the candle, click, <laughs> and uh, you know, turn on some music. Usually it's like a light jazz going on in the background. And then uh, I do most of my work these days on a Cintiq, which is a, you know, a big monitor that uh, and uh, I probably am capable of doing about a page a day now. Um, although I don't always do that, but I'll work from, I'll probably sit down about 10, 30, 11 in the morning and finish about four in the afternoon. 
you know, might break for half an hour for lunch or stuff. But other than that, I'm, I'm really good at focusing. I really love it still. It's kind of hard to get started each morning, but once I'm going, I'm just so happy. And, you know, I don't want to be interrupted. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, when I've got a, a piece done and I'm happy with it, it's, it's really glorious. Um, I, I'm really happy too with being able to self-publish through the Amazon Kindle program because I've got the computer and I've got the skills now to put the whole book together and upload it myself. I don't need anybody else. Yep. And that feels really great. It's like being a little kid again, making my little comic books and stapling them together, you know, and you get an issue finished. It works in the same way. And thankfully, I've been able to pick up a lot of my old readers from the old days through Facebook and social media. And so all I have to do is sort of let them know that I got a new book out and, uh, you know, sales start happening. That's awesome. Um, so you don't use any like brushes or nibs or anything like that anymore. You're fully on the on the well, tablet on a Cintiq? I do because I still do commissions and people want original art for commissions, but the Cintiq makes production artwork so much easier. And especially someone like me, I'm a reference artist to begin with. I used to have like, you know, 50 million books, but now I've got Google <laughs> and I can find anything, any pose I need, any, uh, you know, reference of anything object I need right there. And I can bring it in and, and use it to shape the panel and stuff. And, so things can go really quickly and I can get it to look just like I want. I forgot to ask you earlier, the shift, uh, so I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to backpedal just real quick. Thank you. Uh, the shift from King Hell to Sun comics. Yeah. Why, I, I know I read it in Little Omens, but yeah. why Sun comics? What's it? Well, first you have to, why King Hell? And, yeah. <laughs> which is like such an in your face kind of thing. And I can show you why King Hell because one of the very first dreams I had way back then is King Hell. Whoa. This is like the original series of dreams that got me doing this. I am hell and I dwell at the end of the universe. Wow, that is beautiful. It's a way of me saying, yeah, you know, I'm honoring this, even though it's kind of crazy, but it sort of fits in with comics too. But Sun Comics had been the publishing company when I was a little kid, when I was making my little handmade comics I was just discussing. And so something happened. What was it? Just on a, I think I just Googled on a, on a whim, like who, had, who owns Sun Comics? And it turned out that it was like this guy in Texas. And so I just emailed him and I said, hey, are you doing anything with the domain name? I, I'd like to, he gave it to me. He lovely, <laughs> you know, total gift. And so it just felt right at that point to switch away from King Hell and switch back to Sun Comics, which has a you know slightly nicer connotation, I think, in many people's minds. In full circle. Yeah, that too. And uh, the the psychoidal form is almost like a sun in and of itself. <laughs> it's exactly. all perfect. It all fits in. Um. When are we getting a Rick Beach collection or an artist edition? Um, I don't know. It's like to do those, you've got to work with the big publishers like yeah. IDW. And those guys are all uh, struggling. And the business of publishing comics through comic book stores is in big trouble right now. So um, I, I doubt it'll be, unless I can figure out a way to self publish. Um, but that would require me working with the printers and working with distributors and stuff like that and schlepping books, you know, and I'm pushing 70 now. And, <laughs> you know, I just, you know, having rooms full of books and doing all that kind of stuff is just not something I'm interested in anymore. I'd much rather make art. Yeah. So you just need someone to do it for you. Just you know, Or I need a, a, a sympathetic publisher, you know, yeah. I'm gonna pull it all together. Um, I don't think there'd be a huge market for it. You know, Rarebit Fiends at its highest only sold like 4,000 copies a month. And that was during, you know, when the boom years. So it's a real oddball thing. It's the early pen and ink that I did, probably the first 12 issues is probably the best pen and ink I ever did by hand. Yeah. And I'm proud of it. So I'd love it if it got done. I have all that artwork. I've never sold any of it. So wow. maybe. All right. I'm going to try to 
round up some publishers to just get it all done for you and <laughs> see what I can see what I can do in my limited space over here. That's what I need advocates. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, we'll round them up. Um, so, uh, I mean, yeah, I think that's all I have, unless there's anything else that you would like to offer. Um, I'm always, uh, I, I would at, like to ask you if it was a, it would be, I talked about sending that book earlier. I would love to just as a gift for your time and also just for everything you've created over the years, it's been so inspirational to me. If you wouldn't mind if I could just send you some copies of my own comics that I've made and books that I've written that just like, thank you. You've been such an inspiration. Yeah, and if you have a book that you think I should read, like you spoke of that a book earlier in the interview, but I'm always looking for that. I, that's what I read mostly. I don't read fiction anymore. I read books about the spirit. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, and also, one final note. So I, um, I've been published before through Llewellyn Worldwide. Um, wrote in, I wrote a book called Shamanic Kabbalah. Um, and they actually got me on to write another book and I'm in the midst of writing that. Would you mind, and I'll check with Eli up with Wizard to make sure this is cool. Would you mind if I could use parts of this interview as aspects of that book? Because I talk about dreams and mm -hmm. a lot of the things that you talk about. Would that be okay with you? Absolutely. I mean, I want to get the word out. Excellent. So that people know this, that we all got this potential and it's there. And, you know, maybe a slight percentage of people will actually try to explore it. I think it's what the world needs. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, sir, that's, I mean, I, I feel like we're good and it's uh, been about 50 minutes. I've got a lot of material here. This is going to be really cool. What we do need, I, um, according to Wizard, is if you have any particular images that you want to have displayed in the article, excerpts from the comic or covers itself, a picture of you. We also have artists including myself that are doing spot illustrations so we could always just have one of us draw a caricature of you with dreams spilling out of your head or something as well um well there's so many uh you know self-portraits and rare routines. i mean you could you know dig one of those out okay and maybe some of the the specific experiences i've been talking about that i drew you know that, that might be uh something you could use but i'm, I'm pretty much open to anything okay so if you want me to just collect those then and I'll send them to Eli and just let him choose. Sure, that would work for me. Okay, great. Less, less work on your end and that makes me happy. There you go. <laughs> so, we want you creating, sir. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. I Again, this was a huge honor for me and um, I hope that we can keep in touch. Um, again, I think the post office box that you have on your website is still good, so. Yep. You might get a package from me in the next uh, week or so. Yep, send that dream. You know, just the like a 300 DPI JPEG, black and white. Oh, and I will absolutely. I it in number 25. All right, thank you so much. All right. Okay, you have an excellent day and a great weekend. Yeah. Take care.